Hello and welcome to Canadian Grapevine Certification Network or CGCN's third webinar in a four-part webinar series on grapevine diseases. Focusing today on trunk diseases. My name is Bill Armstrong and I sit on CGCN's Knowledge, Technology and Transfer or KTT's board, along with Darian Cantrell and Ross Wise. To give you a little background on myself, I live in the western end of the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia, Canada, near Annapolis Royal. And in our vineyard, we grow mostly viniferous, like Chardonnay, Riesling, Sauvignon Blanc, and the hybrid Vidal Blanc. The first webinar in this four-part webinar series was on red blotch and was hosted by Darian Tempriel. You will find it on you will find this webinar on CGCN's website, www.cgcn-rccv.ca. The second webinar in this four-part webinar series was on grapevine leaf roll and was hosted by CGCN's Darian Tempriel. And you'll find this also on CGCN's website, www.cgcn-rccv.ca. Today's webinar is on grapevine trunk diseases. We have with us today three very distinguished guests. They are Dr. Jose Berbez Torres, Dr. Jonathan Kaplan, and Dr. David Gramahe. Before I pass this webinar over to Darian, who will be the host and mediator, I would like to mention a few guidelines. Please keep yourself muted throughout the webinar. There will be a Q&A session at the end of this webinar after everyone has presented the material. Please use the chat with a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and ask your questions. And also, please identify who your question is addressed to, either Jose, Jonathan, or David, and Darian our moderator will direct your questions accordingly. This webinar will be posted on CGCN's website shortly. Thank you very much for attending CGCN's webinar. And here's Darian to give you a brief presentation. Darian. Thank you, Bill. I will just take a second to share my screen here. All right, so you should be able to see my screen now. So thank you and welcome to CGCN's third webinar in this four part series. Last time I presented a more detailed overview of CGCN's certification programs. So today I'm going to talk about the other side of our organization, which is CGCN's Grape and Wine Research AgriScience Cluster. The CGCN Board of Directors has maintained a mandate that is twofold. So firstly, it's to advance the Canadian grape and wine industry by ensuring a sustainable domestic supply of certified propagated grapevine material, including both rootstock and cyanwood. The viruses of particular concern for the industry at this time are leaf roll and red blotch, which result in significant economic losses if left unaddressed in a vineyard. And all of this was discussed in our previous webinar on the topic of leaf roll virus. If you go to our website, like Bill has mentioned, you will be able to view the recording there. And secondly, CGCN is also the lead for the Canadian Grape and Wine Science Cluster, which I will discuss in more detail today. So the cluster is made up of 23 activities divided into six different themes. The key to all of this is the science coordination, as well as the knowledge and technology transfer, or KTT, back to the industry, the first and last activities of the cluster, respectively. The first activity is science coordination, which allows CGCN to administer the cluster. Theme one is strategic management of grapevine virus diseases. This theme looks at determining the occurrence of grapevine virus infections across Canada, how insects spread these diseases, and how disease impacts grape yield and quality. Activities in this theme will determine the incidence of virus infections across Canada, the role of insect vectors and the control they play in infection spread, and the virus impacts on grape yield and quality. Results from this would serve to develop strategies to control vectors, mitigate infection impacts to wine quality, and reduce infections in the longer term through adoption of a national clean plant replacement program. Recently added to this theme is activity four, part two, distribution and impact of emergent and invasive insect species in the context of viticultural expansion in Nova Scotia. Theme two is cold hardiness and adaptation to climate change. This theme examines methods to reduce crop losses by increasing vineyard tolerance to extreme cold events through enhanced hardiness, crop protection, sorry, crop protection technologies and improved cultivar selection. Cold weather remains an ongoing challenge for the grape and wine industry across Canada. 
While climate change is predicted to expand areas suitable for wine grape production in the country, more frequent extreme weather through the year, including cold episodes lethal to grape vines, are also predicted. Theme three is sustainable management of soil, water, and crop quality. Activities under this theme focuses on reducing the environmental footprint of grape production, conservation of resources such as water and energy, preservation of natural components of vineyard ecosystems, and the impact of responsible management on fruit and wine quality. Theme four is optimizing the quality of Canadian wines. This theme looks at improving quality of Canadian wines in a way that ensures the environmental sustainability of the production cycle and maintains and grows public trust. Needs addressed are further improvements in wine quality, consistency and value relative to imported wines, and enhanced product diversity in tune with modern consumer preferences, which include natural products. Theme five is reducing the environmental impact of crop protection in grapes. This theme looks to more accurately predict the onset of pest and disease threats. Proposed research will develop novel tools to monitor and address these threats in a way that will dramatically change the current approach to pest recognition and control across the country. So activities 16 and 18 as listed here on the slide have been completed as of March 31st, 2021. Their final reports are to be received by CGCM this year, this spring, sorry, and posted to the CGCM website. And lastly, we have theme six, reducing the environmental impact through novel disease prediction and crop monitoring tools in which there is only one activity. Spatial characterization of terroir and other vineyard attributes using GIS and imaging tools to guide precision management for water and nitrogen and to, to detect infections by virus and other pathogens. The final activity of the cluster is the knowledge and technology transfer or KTT as I mentioned before, which is the cornerstone to the entire project that will include an interactive website, social media, regional meetings and research events, and scientific publications, and these webinars here. Most recently, CGCN has developed a KTT committee comprised of Director Ross Wise from BC, Bill Armstrong, who introduced our webinar today from Nova Scotia, and myself, the project manager of CGCM. The KTT committee has so far been responsible for arranging and hosting webinars, developing social media and newsletter content, and will, in the hopefully near future, be able to arrange field days and develop some video content. Research updates from the Grape and Wine Science Cluster are posted as they become available on the CGCN website under re research heading. Most recently, a number of cold hardiness and growing degree days updates have been posted for BC and Nova Scotia. We also have a post with plain language summaries of each of the projects once per year in the spring. So year two summaries from last year can be found on the, under the cluster research and updates. Year three summaries have CGCN has been receiving the past couple months and will be available under the same heading when they are available. CGCN also has a Twitter and Facebook page dedicated to sharing events, research updates, and other relevant industry resources. Please feel free to follow these accounts if you're active on these platforms. CGCN shares other relevant research updates not funded by the cluster under the resources heading. These include updates and recommendations on biosecurity and virus scouting programs, both domestically and internationally. We also encourage wineries and growers to contact us if they wish to see certain varietals available through our certification programs, as we are consistently monitoring the industry to see what is wanted and to ensure our repository is fulfilling those wants. You can either submit your wish list varietals through our contact page, which is listed here, or you can email the contact, which is me, at the end of my presentation. And lastly, before I conclude my presentation, CGCN would like to thank and acknowledge the funding for this program that has been provided through the AgriScience Program under the Canadian Agricultural Partnership Federal Provincial Territorial Initiative. Thank you again. Here is my email, Darian, D-A-R-I-E-N, at cgcn-rccv.ca. If you have any questions about my presentation here today or want to inquire further about CGCN's programs.
All right, so I will move on to introduce our first speaker of the day, who may seem a little familiar if you were here for our leaf roll session um, two months ago. Dr. Ramon, Jose Ramon Urbez Torres is a research scientist at the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada Summerland Research and Development Centre in British Columbia and serves as adjunct professor in the biology department at the University of British Columbia Okanagan campus. He received a postgrad master's degree in viticulture, enology and wine marketing in 2001 from the International Social Science Council and the degree of agricultural engineering in 2004 from the University of Valladolid, Spain. He completed a PhD in plant pathology in 2009 at the University of California, Davis. Dr. Urbez Torres has studied, studied diseases of woody perennial crops since 1999, and his current research at AAFC focuses on the development and implementation of sustainable management strategies against fungal, bacterial, and viral diseases of grapevines and fruit trees in Canada. So now I welcome Dr. Jose Ramon Urbez Torres to present an introduction into what grapevine trunk diseases are. Thank you very much, Darian. I'm gonna put my screen here. <clears throat> and I believe, can everybody see that? Yes, that's perfect. Yes, can you hear me good? Okay. Thank you. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are. Uh, uh, thank you very much for having me uh, again today talking about uh, another issue. Uh, threatening uh, vineyards, not only in Canada, but worldwide. Uh, this short presentation, basically, many of you probably are uh, already familiar with uh, what grapevine trend diseases are, but the goal of this first five minutes presentation is just to set the stage uh, uh, for some of you that may not be familiar. So I'm going to be briefly describing, you know, what grapevine trend diseases are. So this uh, group of diseases known as grapevine trunk disease or GTD eh, are caused by many different fungi, mostly in the Ascomycota and some in the Basidiomycota, sorry. Uh, and this is one of the main characteristics of these uh, diseases. Uh, they are caused by a very large number of uh, fungal pathogens, not as the usual diseases we know like powdery mildew or botrytis where you know, one disease, one pathogen. In this case, there are many different pathogens causing this problem. So this disease is uh, the pathogens infect grapevines through wounds and openings. And as you can imagine, what we do every year eh, in vineyards is to prune as we need to harvest a crop. So pruning wounds, as you can see, is the main point of infection. However, any other type of wounds caused either by mechanical damage, retraining, can also be a, a point of infection for this fungi. Sun-trunk diseases are thought to be latent pathogens, and I will describe a little bit later what uh, is this about, but it's thought that they can be part of the uh, microbiome of the, of, of, the, of, of the vine. The overall symptoms is include, depending the type of disease or pathogens you have, either a slow or rapid dieback and a sudden vine collapse. Eh? You can see here how this cordon of the vine, you know, has been declining, you know, uh, until it's dead. The progressive death of these parts, you know, such as spurs, cordons, and of course, the eventual death of the vine. Grapevine trend disease occur wherever grapes uh, are uh, grown, and the disease uh, prevalence can vary depending on the graphical region. So we have two main groups of diseases. We have in young vineyards, we have black foot eh, and petri disease caused by all these different type of uh, pathogens, and we normally consider this as young vine decline. And in mature vineyards, we have what we know, the dieback or uh, canker diseases, ESCA, Botrosphere dieback, Eutypa dieback, and Fomopsis dieback. So in terms of the jambine decline or these diseases, you know, external symptoms, you know, overall can be a uh, loss of uh, vigor, uh, poor growth, lack of spring growth. But as you can see in these images, these symptoms are sometimes very difficult to differentiate with other abiotic factors like may happen in vineyards as uh, you know, uh, spring frost or nutrient stress or other uh, issues. So it's, it's quite difficult to uh, identify this jambine decline in, in the vineyard. However, internally, as you can see here, the symptoms are very clear. In this longitudinal section, you can see all this streaking, all this dark color of the wood where the fungus is present. In this cross section, similar all the parts where the, wood, the fungus is infecting, you can see all these necrosis and areas where uh, basically the vascular system is not functioning anymore. 
In mature vineyards, eh, the other type of disease we have, for example, with ESCA, very characteristic symptoms on the leaves, what we know as um, tiger stripes. Uh, the fungus in this complex also can produce some toxins that they are translocated to the grapes, causing what we know as black measles, you know, a very big problem for table uh, grapes where they cannot be marketed, including also the sudden vine collapse that we can experience, you know, in the high uh, water demand periods of the season. Some of the internal symptoms for this uh, ESCA, we can see here with this sponge, you know, uh, yellow with softy boot, because some of the basidomyces, as I mentioned before, are involved. Then we have the canker diseases, you know, with Botryosphaeria, Eutypa, or Formosis dieback, you know, we can see some of these specific uh, symptoms, short internals, uh, leaf um, distortion, or basically just the dieback uh, and death of the part parts. And it's very typical to see these wedge-shaped cankers, you know, where the fungus is progressing in the vascular system. Also, we can have a mixed infection, not only one pathogen or one disease can happen, you know, in this uh, system. So as we can see here, you know, we can have many different pathogens causing all the different symptoms in one plant. Finally, I want to talk about the main sources of an spread. David will go further on that, but one of the issues we have is these pathogens can come in the propagation material and they can be infected at the different stages of the uh, propagation material, but I will leave David to talk about this further in his talk. And also, this is my five minutes. Okay, that's good. And I'm gonna, oh, come on, sorry about that. And finally, I want to mention also the source of a spread of these uh, uh, pathogens is primary in the field. We have all these dead uh, parts of the plant where we have our fruiting bodies, environmental conditions are gonna make these spores uh, to go in the environment and to colonize the pruning goons and start again the life cycle. We have also many other hosts that can infect vineyards, you know, as three fruits of other perennial crops I just sent to to, to grapes that can also be host of these pathogens as well as native plant communities where will also serve as a, a source of inoculum for these plants. So with that introduction, I will stop here and we'll pass it to Darian again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose, for that introduction. And now that we know what grapevine trunk diseases are, we are going to pass it off to talk about the economics of it. So I present to you Jonathan Kaplan, who is a professor in the economics department at Sacramento State University. He earned his doctorate in agriculture and resource economics in 19, 1999 from the University of California, Davis. His research covers topics in sustainable agricultural systems, perennial crop production, agricultural envi environmental modeling and water resource management, and in more recent years on pest and disease management in perennial crop production systems to identify hurdles to adopting alternative control strategies. His work on grape production includes economic analysis of the control of Pierce's disease and grapevine trunk diseases, providing insight into the relative efficacy of alternative strategies to combat pests and disease threatening valuable perennial crop production systems. So now we welcome Dr. Jonathan Kaplan to present the economic impacts of grapevine trunk diseases and costs of choosing different control strategies. Thank you, Daria, and um, thank you for uh, this time today. Um, as uh, we've already seen, trunk diseases can be quite damaging. And so some of the work that I've been working on for the past Oh, it seems like five to 10 years is looking at um, the impact of trunk diseases and also looking at the benefits of different preventative and mitigation strategies. Um, trunk diseases have been around for a while and have been studied in California for, for many, many decades now. And um, still we see um, situations where identify practices that might combat them have not necessarily been adopted. And so part of our work has been trying to identify those hurdles, as, as Darian mentioned, uh, to adopting uh, these uh, tested practices, at least in the field. Um, as Jose uh, mentioned, uh, the pruning wounds are where most, at least in California, where we see most of the um, areas where the vines are susceptible. Uh, we don't have as much um, uh, winter damage, uh, frost damage, uh, but certainly harvesting uh, in many cases is done uh, where some mechanically we might have 
uh, some wounds there that might be susceptible. Uh, we've also seen uh, economic costs uh, as being significant, at least here in California. Um, as early as uh, 2001, uh, Jerry Siebert down at uh, UC Berkeley uh, looked at the impacts of you type of dieback on the state's uh, grape production uh, and estimated close to $260 million a year is lost uh, combating uh, these diseases, um, particularly you type at the time, uh, which at the time comprised about 14% of producer value, which uh, when, when margins are thin, that, that could make or break uh, a vineyard. Um, and we saw that treatment costs were not trivial either um, as early as 2001, uh, where upwards of $60 million a year uh, was being spent on trying to combat these diseases. But nonetheless, um, the um, treatment was not widely adopted throughout the state. And I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, in sort of characterizing the options available and how we might try to understand the hurdles that growers might face. Um, you know, we classify practices into either preventative where practices are adopted before symptoms appear. Uh, here in California, trunk diseases typically don't appear in the vineyard until the vines are eight to 10 years old, um, at which point it's um, often very difficult to um, combat the disease at that point because uh, as we'll see in a little bit, a lot of the vineyard is likely infected at that point. Um, and so that, that brings up the point that it's very important that we start with a, a clean nursery stock um, to give the vineyard a fighting chance uh, to get through what might be um, a very unprofitable enterprise if the trunk diseases um, take over their vineyard. Um, clearly, there are preventative practices and pruning uh, wound uh, pruning practices and pruning wound protectants uh, typically fall under those categories. We've done a lot of work looking at um, application of pruning wound protection, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, there's also been a, a some work done on looking at um, remedial vine surgery, uh, curatage um, methods where parts of the vine are cut out. Uh, where infections are seen uh, in some instances. Um, and what we've been recommending is that uh, vines be um, removed down to just above the grafting wound um, so that there's a guarantee that all of the trunk disease has been removed from that vine. Um, and so um, there are those options. And then there's the most extreme option um, in which a grower may just choose to remove the vines at, at, once the vineyard becomes infected and is no longer profitable uh, and replant uh, either with another uh, grapevine or um, switch to some alternative crops. And so we tried to wrestle with those different options to see how they might improve the profitability of a vineyard um, as sort of the first hurdle because why adopt these practices if it, they don't make us better off? Um, and so that's sort of the first approximation of, of why there might be a hurdle. Um, we also wanted to look at the longevity of the vineyards um, because um, these practices might not extend the longevity of the vineyard and thus uh, may make it um, very costly to keep replanting that vineyard um, as they become non-profitable. Uh, we also wanted to understand when the right time to take action was because um, if we don't start in the nurseries, what might those implications be? We haven't really taken a good close look at that yet. Um, we've mostly looked at how early do you start preventative practices in the vineyard um, to um, maximize profitability, uh, given um, those trunk diseases don't appear until a vineyard is eight or 10 years old. We looked as early as starting pruning wound uh, protectant and other pruning practices that reduce wounds um, as early as uh, when a vine is three years old. And then because growers have many different options available to them, we also wanted to understand to some degree how these different options might be complementary so that growers may 
reap even greater benefits by adopting sort of a suite of these um, different options. Okay. I can give you a little background on California grape production. If you're not familiar, we, we have a large amount of grape production here in California, um, over 895,000 acres um, and many different types of grapes, but primarily wine grapes. Um, the value to California wine grapes, uh, about $3.8 billion uh, annually, uh, or as of, as of 2019, I should say, um, that's how much they earned in 2019. Um, so a, a significant um, industry here in California, and certainly um, trunk diseases pose a major threat if they're requiring vineyards to replace um, vines within every um, 11 or 12 years because trunk diseases are running rampant. Um, and so um, we, we wanted to take a closer look because of how important grapes are here in California. So as I mentioned, as early as uh, 1994, we saw work done on trying to understand the um, disease incident. And we can see here um, from work done uh, by Monkvold and his colleagues that by the time a vineyard is 10 years old, approximately 20% of the vines are symptomatic. Uh, by the time the vineyard is 15 years old, uh, close to 75% of vines are expected to be symptomatic, um, at least here in California, uh, given our climatic and um, differences, um, which is significant if you think that you don't really see vines uh, presenting symptoms until around 10 years old, um, you already have 20% of your vineyard um, showing symptoms at that point um, and, and thus uh, likely infected by uh, grapevine trunk diseases. Uh, Monkvold also put together work to see how the uh, incidence of trunk diseases impacts uh, vineyard yield. And so we incorporated that information into um, cost and return studies done here in California. So we can see here an example, Cabernet Sauvignon, um, that between a healthy vineyard and an unhealthy infected vineyard, um, the yield is significantly impacted, especially um, after year 10. And so that plays a major role in, in trying to understand the, the benefits of uh, the different preventative practices and then vine surgery as well. Uh, similar to the growth in the incidence of the disease, there's also uh, conversely a, a very quick decline in, in the yield as, as noted already. Um, we can see what this um, different condition might do to yields. And here's just an example from a paper back in 2016. Um, but it's, it's very clear that an infected vineyard, by the time uh, you reach year 12, starts to see negative profits because of the decline in that cumulative yield function, that red line uh, or, or, or graph uh, uh, function there. Um, whereas a healthy vineyard uh, will reap about $93,000 over a 25 year lifespan, um, an infected vineyard, if we ran it out at the same period, uh, would do much, much worse. And um, the idea is how much better can we do than minus 50,000 uh, if we were to adopt different trunk uh, preventative practices. And so uh, there's been some work done and you see Jose's name up there as well. Uh, I'm sure David's uh, name is included in some of those citations as well. Um, but there's been work done on, on the efficacy of these different preventative practices. Um, and so we use this information to explore the economic consequences of adopting these practices to see how growers may be able to benefit from adopting these practices at when a vineyard is three years old or when it reached maturity, at least here in California, at year five. And then uh, we also evaluate at year 10 to see what the implications are um, if we wait until we see the symptoms in the vineyard. Um, we also evaluate remedial vine surgery, as mentioned earlier, uh, where we um, assume that the vine is uh, locked off right there above the grafting wound. Uh, and then uh, shoots then would regenerate and um, eventually within two years uh, produce grapes at the previous yield of a healthy vine, uh, unless it's infected. 
<laughs> but um, we also evaluated this at, at different uh, success rates in terms of um, regenerating shoots and found that even when these vines don't generate new shoots, uh, because that trunk disease is removed and it slows the disease is spread significantly, uh, it's still profitable um, even when there's no regenerative shoots. Um, just to sort of take us a, a step back um, and sort of why this research was conducted, um, we did a survey of grape growers and found that although many of them have adopted these practices, uh, many of them, if not most, of, a, a majority of them uh, don't do so until the vineyard uh, is showing symptoms year eight and, and older. Uh, and you can see that in that figure there. Um, I should mention that um, in our analysis, uh, these three different practices have different costs. And that's likely also explaining why we see greater adoption of delayed pruning uh, at, or, or rather, uh, well, we'll get to this in a little section, in a little moment. Okay, so um, looking at these practices and their implications on yields, uh, we can see that um, in this case, we're adopting the practice in year three, uh, and we can look at different efficacy rates, whether the um, pruning practices or the pruning wound protectants are, um, 25% effective in, in the sense that 25 fewer uh, vines become symptomatic in the following year, or 50% or 75% um, based on the previous literature, we see that when vines are 75% or when the treatment is 75% effective, um, our yield is nearly identical to a healthy vineyard. Conversely, if the efficacy is 25%, we're further down very close to the unhealthy level by the time we get to year 25. And so fortunately for um, many of the studies have found efficacy much higher than 25%, um, but nonetheless, we wanted to see what the lower bound might be if there were one. Um, we converted that information into cumulative net benefits uh, across vineyards. Uh, and you can see here that the blue and black lines are very similar uh, in that if we do adopt early in year three, uh, we do see that the vineyard is able to maintain a fairly uh, healthy uh, yield uh, and result in, in positive profits throughout the vineyard's lifespan of 25 years. Uh, however, if we do nothing, again, we lose uh, money, uh, and uh, the other efficacies uh, fall in line there too. But uh, in all three of these efficacy cases, we see that net returns are greater than zero uh, after adopting, which means not only are these practices uh, better than doing nothing, but uh, return the vineyard to a profitable level at least after 25 years. Uh, okay, looking at some numbers, and, and yes, there are a lot of numbers here, but they're all in, in it showing that in all cases that we looked at, and we looked at vineyards in five different regions growing Cabernet Sauvignon in each one of those regions uh, for the different practices in different years. And this is just sort of putting it all out there for you to see. Uh, the important takeaway here is, is that all of these practices, at least in wine grapes, uh, result in greater net benefits to the grower when they adopt these practices, whether it's year three, five, or seven. The returns are much greater when the practices are adopted in year three, as opposed to year five or year 10, because the plant just has that many more years to, the, the disease is just slowed that much more uh, if we start in year three versus year five or year 10. Uh, delayed pruning is the least expensive. That's why the costs, the net benefits are greater for delayed pruning. Uh, the most uh, delayed pruning is just switching when you prune and that shouldn't have any additional labor costs associated with it. The main challenge there is labor. And so we don't see 100% uh, adoption of delayed pruning because of uh, significant labor constraints. Uh, right before bud break uh, limits, uh, it creates anxiety and risk uh, that pruning won't be done before bud break. And so 
Uh, other options are applied, such as um, painting a pruning wound protection. We evaluated uh, Topsin because of the field trials that were available over that time period. Uh, and then, uh, which was roughly around $100 per acre uh, to um, apply. Um, and then there was double pruning, which requires two passes through a vineyard, which was the most expensive. And we saw uh, costs um, exceeding $200 an acre. And thus you can see that reflected in that, that figure there. Uh, we also looked at what effect these different practices have on the longevity of the vineyard. Um, and in all cases, pretty much when the vineyard, um, it, when the efficacy is 50% or greater, uh, we're able to uh, more than um, double the vineyard's lifespan. What, what we don't see here is the, uh, when the vineyard would um, be no longer profitable if we did nothing, and that's around year 12, um, noted earlier in, in one of those figures. Um, but in all cases, because we adopt early uh, or we have uh, high efficacy, we're going to get um, the full lifespan of that vineyard, uh, reducing any um, excessive reestablishment costs that, that might arrive from having to replant a vineyard sooner than, than later. Um, there's just some other highlights. Um, we also did um, some analysis, as I mentioned, looking at vine surgery, uh, where uh, in this case, we're looking at the results for uh, Napa, uh, our most profitable uh, vineyard area uh, here in California. Um, and we just looked at a 50% disease control efficacy, efficacy rate over 50, 25 years. Um, and you can see uh, noted here, uh, if I just do delayed, uh, delayed pruning and I adopt in year three, um, my net benefits are gonna be $121,000 or so. If I didn't do that and I just waited until symptoms appear uh, and did vine surgery, then that box in the lower uh, bottom of the, um, under year 10 uh, would reflect vine surgery would be uh, adopted at that point. Uh, and it's more profitable, same if I did it in year 11 when it, it's uh, most profitable to do vine surgery. Um, but what we see is that if I had also done some preventative practices before vine surgery, I would have had greater returns. Um, and that's if I adopted in year 10. If I had adopted those pruning wound uh, practices in year five, my profitability would have been even greater uh, if I had, uh, and, and optimal if I did uh, my surgery in year 13. Uh, and then again, if we wait, if we start as early as possible, once the trees are established here, year three, um, then we would do the best uh, when we combine both these preventative practices with uh, vine surgery. So we can see here that they're, they're certainly complements. Um, and so, um, we often encourage growers to consider adopting preventative practices early because of the benefits that they can derive from adopting those practices early. Um, and similarly, uh, if they adopt early, they can uh, expect if they do have trunk diseases in their vineyard, they won't have to necessarily do vine surgery until much later in the vineyard's lifespan, um, thus creating greater net benefits. In all cases where we did preventative practices and vine surgery, the, vi the vines grew to their full 25 year lifespan. So I don't have an accompanying uh, figure for that. Um, but um, one of the artifacts of our figure of our analysis was that we use a 25 year lifespan. I'm going a little long here, so I'm gonna uh, cut it short. So what we did instead was uh, we replaced the vines uh, when they became non-profitable. Uh, and what this figure shows is that in all cases, it's more profitable to do vine surgery, preventative practices rather, um, than to do vine surgery. Um, vine surgery here is the, the no PP at the end there, that's no preventative practices. That does worse over a 75 year period than any of the preventative practices. So uh, there, we have more evidence of the benefits of doing preventative practices and vine surgery. Uh, so I'm just gonna scroll down to the end here uh, and shoot off the conclusions uh, so I don't take any more time. Um, but basically, um, in all scenarios, we found uh, the net benefits improved uh, when we did preventive practices and vine surgery. Um, they're complementary and we recommend them being adopted uh, 
similar it, it when when uh, symptoms become apparent um and clearly uh without a clean nursery stock um growers are set up for failure and so that that's sort of the first line of defense uh at least here is to give growers a fighting chance and have clean nursery stock so i will uh thank you again for uh, letting me share uh, some of these insights with you and um hopefully we'll we can move to questions uh, in a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for your presentation. And I like how at the end you noted that clean nursery stock gives growers a fighting chance. CGCNs, certified vines, make sure you are purchasing certified virus-free vines from nurseries that you trust. Uh, we already have some questions coming in, which we will discuss at the end of the session. Um, and just a reminder to all attendees, please put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will be addressing them at the end. And I will jump right into our next presenter today. We have Dr. David Gromahay, who is a research scientist at the Institute of Grapevine and Wine Sciences, or ICVV, in Logroño. Since 2015, David is the head of the research group BioVT at ICVV. His main research interest focuses on the application of next generation sequencing technology to explore the soil and grapevine microbiome and its interaction with fungal pathogens. David is also actively involved in the development and implementation of integrated management strategies of grapevine trunk diseases in nursery and vineyard. Now we please welcome David to discuss the status of grapevine trunk diseases in Spain and how to control them at the nursery and young uh, vineyard level. Thanks, Dadian, for the introduction. So, yeah. can you see the presentation? I can, but your video has been turned off. Would you like to turn that back on? Okay, I think it's, I had problems this morning with a webinar, but okay. As long as we can hear you, we should be fine. I just yeah. wanted to okay. let you know about that. Okay, so as Jose mentioned before, this pathosystem is really complex. So there are many fungal species associated with the GDD symptoms. Uh, they, uh, they have different biology and epidemiology, and of course, no curative measures are known for control of GTDs. So these uh, diseases are best managed by, by an integrated strategy, including different tools, giving priority to non-chemical methods. So this strategy can be applied through the entire production chain for model blocks to uh, newly and mature vineyards. So in this presentation, I'm going to discuss the currently available strategies to reduce GDD infections based on published research giving priority to experiments performed under nursery and field conditions. So proper pruning practice and protection as well as cultural practices and sanitation must be applied in mother blocks. Rootstock mother plants can be cultivated in several systems. So sprawl on the soil surface, sprawl on woven fabric and with horizontal and vertical trellis system. So vines on a trellis system have some uh, agronomical advantages and it can also eliminate or reduce potential soil surface pathogen contamination. In contrast, these systems are much more labor intensive and expensive than vines sprawl on the ground. Regarding the irrigation, so different systems can be used to irrigate nursery model blocks. Drip irrigation is strongly recommended since overwatering always favors most soil borne pathogenic fungi. And in the case of overhead sprinkler irrigation, this system can trigger a spot release of several GTD pathogens. Regarding the sanitation, removing and destroying all diseased wood from the vineyard still remains the best practice to reduce the number of new infections for all GTD pathogens affecting mother blocks and mature plants. Infected wood and pruning debris can be destroyed by composting, mulching and incorporation into the soil of the vineyard or burning. So burning has several environmental disadvantages. Therefore, this practice is being replaced by other options such as composting and or mulching. So in France, 
researchers show composting of vine material along with sheep manure and garden residues for six months to successfully eliminate inoculum of GTD pathogens from grapevine wood tissue. At this point, I recommend reading this paper where we established a protocol for the management of grapevine rootstock mother vines to reduce GTD infections in cuttings. So we mentioned different options like, us, like uh, training systems, irrigation, cultural practices and sanitation, and pruning wound protection. So winter pruning is the main port of entry of GTD pathogens in the vine. So pruning wound protection is essential to keep healthy plants. Nowadays, we have uh, strong restrictions and difficulties on the use of chemicals to protect pruning wounds. So mastics and paints are by far the most reliable wood protectants, particularly when they are supplemented with fungicides, such as the benzimidazole carbamate mode of action group or the uh, demethylation inhibitors. These fungicides can provide a physical barrier to stop the GTD pathogen spores from entering the vine, and they can also act on the pathogens if the physical barrier is compromised by subflow, drain, or cracking when drying. However, in general, uh, the use of these fungicide groups is prohibited in most grape growing regions around the world. Recent research carried out in, in California and Spain demonstrated that the mixture pyraclostrobin plus boscalid was very effective in protecting pruning wounds against GTD infection in commercial vineyards. This is a liquid formulation fungicide that can be applied with a sprayer. However, it cannot be used in an organic management. So an alternative that is gaining interest over the last years is the use of biological control agents. So most studies on the use of BCA have been focused in the application of trichoderma species under control conditions. So in general, uh, biological control agents have shown variable results for preventing infection by GTD pathogens. So they show good performance um, under field condition in South Africa and Italy, but we had bad experience with the use of trichoderma to protect pruning wounds in commercial vineyards in Spain. Jose will probably talk later about his experience with the use of trichoderma in Canada. In the propagation processes, priority should be given to the application of biological and physical treatments due to the reduction in the availability of efficient chemicals in nurseries. So three important aspects to consider in, in this section so nurseries provide nearly optimal environments for fungal development, wet and humid conditions in hydration tanks and caiusin, high root density within caiusin containers and the field rooting stage. In general, close spacing of plants. This will enhance opportunities for pathogen spread and reproduction. Even with these favorable conditions for disease development risk, disease will not develop if, if the pathogens are not present. Um, however, production practices in most nurseries provide many opportunities for fungal trunk pathogen introduction through a poor sanitation practices or through pruning wounds, the disbudding stage or the dramatic action of putting together the scion and the rootstock in an omega grafting machine. Unfortunately, it's often difficult to detect trunk disease infected plants in the nursery. It's frequent to see uh, in field nurseries this type of high, high quality planting material with no physical defects, no foliar symptoms, graft union healthy and strong, uh, probably appropriate length and thickness of the rootstock with at least three to four buds and with healthy and evenly distributed roots. However, when we cut these plants uh, at the base of the rootstock, we frequently appreciate this necrosis from which we frequently isolate fungal trunk pathogens. It is very common to see external asymptomatic plants. So these fungi can act as latent pathogens and may become pathogenic to the grapevine following biotic and or abiotic stress factors. So up to date, it's not possible to ensure that propagation material is free of GTD pathogens by non-destructive sampling. Given this scenario, the message is clear, start clean, keep it clean. So the recommendations are related to the use of pathogen-free planting material, to clean, to clean grafting machines frequently, 
maintain a high standard of general cleanliness in the nursery, particularly the grafting, cayusing and cool rooms. Never, never re reuse cayusing media, which is a potential source of the pathogen inoculum, and uh, try to avoid soaking cuttings in water for long periods of time. This can create cross-contamination um, with other planting material. Although chemical control was effective in the past to control GTD pathogens in nurseries, only kinosol is currently authorized in Europe, in particular in, in Germany. And its efficacy is very low compared to, for example, carbendazime, ciprodinyl, and fluidoxinil. One of the possible alternatives to, to the use of chemical control in nurseries is the application of biological control agents. Recently, researchers in Italy and Spain demonstrated that the application of trichoderma atrovirida, the strain SC1, at the hydration stage, effectively reduced infection by petri disease pathogens in Italian and Spanish nurseries and Botrysferiasi species in Spanish nurseries. So no significant effect was observed against black food disease severity. Another option, so treating propagation material with hot water could be one of the most effective methods to reduce fungal infection. Um, however, some anecdotal reports of high losses have been published, especially when long duration treatments are applied to cuttings. It's important to consider that some Vitis vinifera varieties are more sensitive than to hot water treatment than others. For example, in this study carried out in, in Australia, Pinot Noir was highly sensitive to the treatment and Cabernet Sauvignon was the least sensitive among several cultivars. So it's also important to consider that the tolerance of plants to hot water treatment is affected by the climate in which the cuttings are grown. Uh, for example, in New Zealand, they cannot treat more than 50 degrees because 50 degrees causes mortality of cuttings. On the other hand, studies conducted in Spain have shown that 53 degrees significantly improves efficacy against trunk disease pathogens without, without any effect on grapevine cuttings. So in general, New Zealand has a cooler climate than, than Spain. And finally, hot water treatment is not completely effective in eliminating fungal trunk disease pathogen growth. In this study, we examined fungal communities after hot water treatment using high throughput throughput applicon sequencing based on total RNA and demonstrated that these treatments reduced the infection caused by fungal trunk disease pathogens but was not completely effective in eliminating the growth. So we got some colonies, some percentage of abundances of these pathogens at 53 degrees. In the nursery field, I think it's important to highlight alternative strategies to chemical control and a promising practice is the biofumigation. After caiusing, here in the process, after caiusing, vines are transported and planted in an open root field nursery. So the rooting nursery soil is a critical propagation stage where fungal trunk pathogens, mainly blackfoot fungi, can infect planting material in gray vine. Here you can see the, the disease cycle of blackfoot. Blackfoot pathogens persist in soil as uh, mycelium in rotten root fragments or as resting spores called chlamydospores that can survive for several years. Blackfoot pathogens can also infect alternative hosts such as weeds or cereals, which makes the implementation of crop rotation in nurseries really difficult. In Portugal and South Africa, researchers demonstrated an increase of blackfoot disease incidence in a crop rotation cycle. In addition, blackfoot disease fungi have been detected directly from soil during rotation systems with wheat and barley in Portugal and, and Spain. Biofumigation could be a sustainable alternative to the use of chemicals. Biofumigation with Indian mustard seed meal in New Zealand and with white mustard in Spain and Canada reduce blackfoot disease incidence and fungal inoculum in soil. In newly established vineyards, it's important to select apparently healthy planting material and also carry out an adequate site preparation and vine management. So in this section, I will also talk about the current status of biological control as a preventive strategy before planting. Here are some recommendations uh, for growers to select grafted plants. 
just to highlight that grafted plants should have at least three healthy and damaged and evenly spaced roots, as you can see in this photo. Grafts should be fully healed, not overgrown, and not able to be broken by moderate pressure applied by the thumb, as you can see here in these photos. As I suggested before, a master seed meal can be incorporated into the soil, or a rotation crop of mustard can be grown until flowering and then incorporated before planting. In addition, compacted soil layer should be broken up before planting and vines should be well placed in large planting holes. In many instances, black foot disease can be found in association with a condition known as J rooting. So this condition is the result of poor planting of the vines in which roots are oriented upward. Here we can see an infected vine uh, that developed a second layer of roots due to blackfoot disease in order to compensate for the loss of functional roots further below. Regarding the pre-planting strategies, recent research carried out under field conditions investigated the efficacy of several biological control agents to prevent infections by blackfoot and petri disease pathogens. In South Africa, trichoderma species were not sufficient to prevent infections by blackfoot disease pathogens, but a certain degree of protection was obtained in the basal ends. In Spain, we recently performed an experiment to evaluate the preventive effect of two potential biological control agents, that is Streptomyces sp and the Oomycete pitium oligandrum, and three BCA commercial products containing trichoderma trobiride, trichoderma coningi, and a mixture of bacteria, Pseudomonas fluorescens plus Bacillus atropheus. So the conclusion of this study was that uh, one biological control agent alone was not completely effective in reducing GTD incidence and severity. So the combination of the disease suppressive activity of two or more beneficial microbes is required to prevent fungal infection. So we have now to consider the viability of this action and if it's viable or not for the grower to combine several biological control agents. Another interesting option would be the application of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi as a pre-planting strategy. Um, recent research carried out by the group of Miranda Hart in collaboration with other researchers, mostly in Canada, demonstrate, demonstrated basically that a colonization by arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi did not suppress blackfoot pathogens, but instead increased the abundance of them. And uh, the commercial arbuscular mycorrhizal fungal inoculant failed to establish in the vineyard despite priori priority advantage. So uh, I think more research is needed to assess the efficacy of these products against GTD pathogens. Regarding the management of young vines, adequate vine and root development should be allowed to occur prior to placing a heavy fruit load on vines in the early production uh, years in order to avoid this type of stress. So this is the ideal situation, no yield during the first three years and increasing the yield little by little until, until full production the uh, year eight or 10 after planting, depending on the uh, rootstock and cultivar combination. So we should avoid that. This is the second year after planting, second harvest in central Spain, in, in Castilla-La Mancha. And here the ideal situation, which is the third summer. So we have the plant ready to train and we have to avoid this situation. At this point in this review by Jose and collaborators, you can find all the information related to stress factors and disease development. So you can check this, uh, this, this paper. I would like to recommend reading this, these other papers. The first one by Helen Waite and collaborators in Australia about graven propagation principles and methods for the production of high quality graven planting material. And the second one, a review we published in Plant Disease three years ago about the management of grave brain diseases in nurseries, young and mature vineyards. To conclude my presentation, um, just to say that the spread of fung fungal trunk pathogens via infected nursery material is an uh, established problem that cannot be solved quickly. So nurseries must undertake substantial efforts to improve uh, sanitation. And now uh, we observe that three crop nurseries are also struggling to meet demands for plant material, as in the case of Ray Vine many years ago. 
So uh, we have many reports of trunk disease pathogens in other crops, in nurseries, almond and forest nurseries in Spain, blueberry nurseries in New Zealand, and olive nurseries in South Africa. So a general question, can we really produce disease-free plant material even when following clean production best management practices? As a future direction, so the development of a clean plant certification programs have several challenges. As we mentioned before, a broad range of taxonomically unrelated pathogens are um, included in this pathosystem. So the plant nursery conditions and practices favor from fungal infection and the detection and identification requires destructive sampling. So a fast and reliable method for screening large number of plants for fungal trunk pathogens infections is needed. So Jose developed a DNA macroarray some time ago. This can be a good option. And for viruses, so they use next generation sequencing approaches from asymptomatic tissues to screen large number of plants. So it can be adopted to fungal trunk pathogens or brevi. And uh, we also need to assess the impact of global trade and the implication of trunk disease infection in other tree crop nurseries. So finally, I would like to acknowledge the Canadian Grave Certification Network for inviting me to give this seminar. So hope you enjoy the seminar and thanks for listening. Thank you, David, for that presentation. A lot of useful knowledge, I know, for all the growers uh, who are attending here today. Uh, and for our last presentation of the day, he already introduced our session here. I'm going to pass it back to Jose Arbez Torres, who will be able to offer the Canadian perspective on grapevine trunk diseases and updates on some research. Uh, no, we cannot hear you. When you had your headset on, we, we were able to hear you in the beginning. And I just want to remind everyone, we do have some questions coming in. Uh, put your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll be addressing them at the end of the session. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay, sorry, I have some issues here changing the... I was running out of battery, so, okay. Let's go for the next one. Okay, can everybody see the presentation and all good? Yes, you're good to go. Okay, thank you. So for this uh, second part of my talk, I'm gonna present basically the current status of grapevine trunk disease in Canada. We have a pretty good uh, introduction by the economic impact that this disease is caused by Jonathan and also the issues that this disease, disease is causing in nurseries and young vineyards. Uh, I just wanted to mention that we are basically touching in this first webinar, the situation of grapevine trunk disease in, in nurseries and young uh, vineyards or newly established vineyards. There is another uh, aspect of this with mature vineyards that actually we are preparing a, a potential second webinar for later, just talking about the control of these diseases in, in mature vineyards. I just wanted to make clear of, of that. So regarding uh, Canada, uh, it's interesting because actually Canada was one of the first countries describing trans diseases. You know, there is a paper uh, from Chamberlain et al. in 1964, where they discovered, you know, the Botryosphericae species deployed a motila causing cankers in, in Ontario in 1964. Unfortunately, not too much attention or follow up on this, on this work was conducted. So basically in mid 2000s in British Columbia, uh, started experiencing Significant plant mortality, primarily, you know, in newly established vineyards, and that comes, you know, as a result of the industry expansion, you know, that the BC experienced after uh, mid 1990s, and also yield losses in mature vineyards, you know, that they were planted between 1995 and 2000, where the industry really expanded. So, of course, this was primarily attributed to abiotic factors, you know, uh, of uh, winter kill or spring frost or some of the disease that we have here to deal in, in cold climate, like in, in Canada, uh, that are favored by climatic conditions, like, for example, uh, crown gold disease. Uh, however, the BC industry uh, was very interested in researching other potential biotic causes, you know, of, of this uh, problem. 
And the BC One Great Council include trans disease as a research priority in 2009. So these are actually the three projects that have been funded on grapevine trans diseases since 2010. You know, the, the different uh, funding um, projects we have had. Uh, so basically, uh, in these three projects, we approach our first project uh, from 2010 to 2013, try to understand what is the incidence, you know, and how is the importance of trans disease here in British Columbia, and develop the first diagnostic tools, some of them that uh, David has mentioned. Our second step was to understand how the disease work in our environment, try to understand the epidemiology, where the spores are coming from, what are the environmental conditions that favor this spore release in order to develop, you know, uh, effective controls. And currently in our Growing Forward 2 project, our CAP project, we are basically working on implementing information that we have obtained in the previous projects to really look for solutions and controls here in Canada. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk uh, results of our first you know, project, as well as some of the results we have been obtained in our second and third uh, project on giant planting material. So just to start, determining the incidence of these pathogens in BC from 2011 and 2013, we conducted large field surveys. Yeah, about 130 vineyards were monitored constantly, 50 young vineyards and 70 mature vineyards. Our young vineyards were uh, established under the age of eight years old. That's what we consider a young vineyard here in, in, in BC. And, and the mature vineyards over, 70, uh, over eight years old. In each of these vineyards, we uh, uh, build these quadrants of about 500 vines that they were monitored, you know, twice a year and to assess for systems. So approximately we have about 60,000 vines um, visually inspected, you know, twice a, a year. So some of the overall results we found, you know, doing this first monitoring and survey. So gray white trend disease symptomatic vines were found in 95% of vineyards that we surveyed, which was, a little bit of a surprise in the sense that the industry was thought that, uh, you know, the um, isolation of uh, the area here in the Okanagan Valley with not major wine regions around, uh, they thought that it could be, you know, a safe of, of most of these uh, diseases. Uh, our results saw that, you know, we estimated that about 10% of grapevine trans diseases, you know, grown in BC are infected eh, with um, trans diseases. We found that up to 40% incidence in a single jam vineyard. And of course, you know, depending on the vineyards, eh, eh, we have for a, from a lower eh, to a much higher incidence, but 40% was the highest incidence we have in a single vineyard. And it was interesting to see that 50% of the jam vines that we monitor early in the season, eh, we saw that they would die. They would be completely dead by the end of the season in August, September, when we did the second monitoring. In mature vineyards, again, the incidence varies significantly, but we had up to 80% incidence in a single mature vineyard of trans diseases. And we also observed that in many of these mature vineyards, replacing vines, those young vines that they were you know, used as replants, they show a young vine decline about 8%. And similarly, half of these vines would die you know, by the end of that growing season. So overall, we observed a significant jump by decline incidence. And here you have some of the symptoms I uh, saw at the beginning, you know, either in young vineyards or the cankers and die back in some of the mature vineyards we saw here in BC. So just to give you an idea, you know, in this uh, graph, so we have see here the incidence of trans diseases in every single of the 120 vineyards we monitor. And this is basically the average by uh, age group. So we can see here, you know, some of the vineyards in year two or three with very, very high incidence, you know, and we hypothesize that some of this material probably came compromised from, from nursery. Eh? And this is some of the vineyards we saw with up to 40% incidence. Then we can see here that, you know, also some of the vineyards between five and 10 years infected by usually between five, 10 or 15 years, we have kind of a plateau here where incidence is not very high. And as you have heard from Jonathan uh, Kaplan, most of the symptoms we start seeing when vineyards are, you know, eight or 10 years older. So infections may happen earlier, but symptoms may not occur or may be visible in the field. And we can see here after the 10, 12 years, you know, all the, the older the vineyard gets, the higher incidence of disease, you know, with some of the vineyards I mentioned up to 80%. However, we still see, you know, some of all vineyards where we didn't see symptoms, you know, and this is a very interesting situation on following up on some of the practices conducted in those vineyards where no symptoms were observed. 
So if we see the average groups, you know, we can see, you know, uh, an average about of 10% infection, you know, during the first years and as, you know, the, the progression of the age increase, you know, and much higher symptoms in our vineyards. So we collect about more than 500 samples, you know, to determine uh, the grapevine trans diseases. And we use two uh, type of um, uh, identification, uh, traditional plating morphology from those samples, as well as molecular identification using DNA techniques. So what we found, not surprising, as in other places, is about, you know, a little bit more than 30 different fungi were found in British Columbia eh, in the black food and petri disease. And all the pathogens found causing cankers and dieback, you know, associated with these uh, wet say cankers in the botryosphariasi, eh, the utypa, the atripacy, and the fomopsis as well. So we uh, actually identify over 30 pathogens here in British Columbia. So as a summary of this first uh, part, you know, so grapevine trans disease were identified and present in BC in all grape grown regions. Symptomatic vines recorded in 95% of vineyard survey. We have about estimation that 10% of vines planted in BC have been or are infected and showing symptoms with trans diseases. The incidence varies among survey vineyards and can go, you know, up to 40% in young vineyards and 80% in mature vineyards. We saw a high incidence of vine, young vine decline and mortality. We found over 30 different pathogens, you know, in young vines, as uh, David has mentioned, some of the most common were Famonia chlamydospora, Cardophora turibacea, and species of Phalonectria. And in mature vines, we have Neophosicum parvum, which is one of the most virulent species within the grapevine trans disease complex, Diplodia seriata, and species in the diatripacy family, which are, for example, your type of However, no other comprehensive work has been conducted in other provinces in Canada. Some of the results we have are from a work that has done in looking for this type of diseases in Northeast United States, and they have included some samples, you know, from some areas in Ontario and Quebec, but there is no really uh, knowledge on the incidence and the significance of these pathogens in uh, none of the of these provinces. I've been working close together with uh, Dr. Wendy McFadden Smith from Mafra, where you know, uh, she has been able sometimes to submit samples from Ontario. And we have been able to identify a group of pathogens from symptomatic vines in Ontario, no surprising, same as we see and same as in other parts of, uh, of the world. So the diseases are present, but uh, up to that, uh, no, no, um, no, work has been conducted, you know, to, to understand better what is the status of these diseases in other provinces. So as uh, <clears throat> David has mentioned, you know, the health status of grapevine nursery, you know, it, it can be a, a problem. So we were interested uh, because of the high incidence we were observing in British Columbia to investigate, you know, how are the plants coming into Canada? So in this case, we have vines from different nurseries and we collect samples, you know, from different parts of the vine, the scion, the graph union, the basal end of the rootstock and, and the roots. And we did two types of uh, ray isolation for the fungi, which is the traditional plating and the DNA macroarray that uh, we developed that are able to screen for up to 70 different fungi at the same time. So overall from this uh, first uh, study we did, we found that over 90% of the plants will have the species in the Ileonectria, the Oletra dacrolima, the blackfoot, Diseases, all these on orange are black food species, a species in the Botryosphariaceae, five more near lab to 60% of the plants, Cadofra autolibacea, and so on. You can see here the many different fungi we found uh, in the planting material uh, being used in, in Canada. So, you know, as David has mentioned, no surprising, uh, the planting material can be uh, a source uh, of this pathogen at a very, very high uh, incidence. So, we were also observing while doing this work that some of these fungi, you know, were found in asymptomatic material. So we can have here a plant from the nursery with no obvious symptoms of necrosis or any internal symptoms, but we were able to identify the same pathogens than plants who are showing these characteristic symptoms. So as we have mentioned before, we believe that these pathogens can be uh, act as latent pathogens. So they stay dormant until we assume maybe a stress condition can happen. And we can have with hypothesis, you know, uh, recently we have published where if a vine, you know, is not under stress, I mean, it eventually will die under natural conditions. This is the natural grapevine death, but will give, you know, of course, a much longer time of production. 
If the vine has one uh, of these strand diseases and is under stress, it may have a premature death. And if we have a mix of pathogens, as we have seen, you know, that this can be several pathogens in, in one plant, under stress, we have a much earlier death. So this is the hypothesis we observe. Also, we have a colonization threshold. And what that means is we believe that the pathogen needs to be at a higher inoculum that the plant can actually resist or, 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 or fight against. So this came to our uh, current work that we have been developing a uh, absolute quantification tool for uh, identify these pathogens in, in nursery material. This is a drop digital PCR, and I'm going to enter in, in details. But basically, what this tool gives us is a much sensitive and accurate you know, uh, quantification of a pathogen than the standard qPCR. And we have developed primers or probes to detect all these main pathogens that we have found in planting material. So quickly, this is just showing you, for example, Phymoniella chlamydospora pathogen. These are from many different plants. You can see here, the more blue dots you see, the more inoculum we have found in one plant. So you can see plants with a high significant amount of, uh, sorry, of inoculum uh, in, in the plant, while other plants you know, will not have practically any of inoculum, or some of them they will have very low. So overall, here we have three different varieties, 15 plants per each we were analyzing eh, with different pathogens. And you can see that you know uh, the incidence uh, vary uh, among uh, cultivars. From Maria Camidospora, for example, we found that in 100% of the Chardonnay and less than 50% in Pinot Noir. But your Spharacea species, we find very low in most of the cultivars. And for example, Cadofra Utribacia, we find 100% of the plants tested in Chardonnay Merlot and about 50%. These high numbers that we see in these uh, plants, when plants, you know, when 100% of the plants come, or we, we are able to identify a pathogen, we assume or we hypothesize that maybe the presence of the pathogen may not result of disease development and eventual plant health. If 100% of the plants coming with familiar chlamydospora means that those plants in the field are going to die, well, maybe we cannot grow Chardonnay anymore. And that's not the case, you know. I mean, our plants still thrive in the, in the, in the vineyard. Uh, even with probably the presence of some of these pathogens. So it's possible that we have, you know, a threshold that certain amount of inoculum will make these plants, you know, to become sick, or as David has mentioned, you know, uh, stress factors. So as I mentioned before, there are significant pathogen concentration difference between cultivars, and this is for Phamonella camidospora. Here we have some plants, you know, in Chardonnay, very high uh, inoculum concentration, you know, here, green, Merlot, one plant. The rest of the Merlot plants have very low. Or for example, Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir almost didn't show high levels of inoculum. We have 50% of plants infected with Phamonella camidospora, but a very, very low inoculum. Eh? So we have seen a significant uh, um, um, pathogen concentration uh, varies in cultivars. Same, it can vary in the parts of the plant. You know, Here is, for example, in Chardonnay, for Phamonella chlamydospora, we can see how our detection tool found the most of the inoculum is happening in the graft union, uh, following by the basal end of the rootstock and then the scion. Phamonella chlamydospora is not a soil-borne pathogen, so we didn't find it in the roots. But if you think about it, and you hear David talking, the graft union and the basal end of the rootstock are the areas where in nurseries, you know, they get uh, cut. That's where we made our cuts to, to make these plants. So that's basically also a point of entrance. So uh, finally, as I mentioned before, you know, our current projects are trying to determine, you know, these factors that may be favor the transition from this latent uh, period to a virulent phase on trans diseases. We can have, you know, abiotic stress like water stress, nutrition, Overcropping, as David has mentioned, you know, we have our, you know, abiotic conditions in Canada, like winter kill, you know, our cold climatic conditions, uh, J-rooting, nematodes, or other diseases in the field that may cause stress. So actually, I have a PhD student that we are conducting different studies, and they are ongoing in the greenhouse and in the field to try to look for um, answers to, to whether really these stress conditions will favor disease which as a result will give us, you know, uh, the best planting conditions and the best ways to treat these um, plants when, when we have to establish a vineyard. So finally, as a summary, so we have developed and implemented two accurate sensitive molecular tools. We have the DNA macroarray, which, you know, 
uh, is not quantitative, it's only present or absence, but we can use it as a multiplex and run for 70 different pathogens in one test. We have developed a absolute quantification method, which again, uh, is not a multiplex in the sense that we can only go with a single or up to two pathogens per run, but it gives us an absolute quantification. So we have seen a high presence of trans disease fungi in natural material in Canada, Ileonectria, Phimonella, and Cadophora, as uh, results in other parts in the world, are the main pathogens found in this uh, um, planting material. Uh, the presence or the abundance of these pathogens varies significantly between cultivars and the plant parts of the cultivar. The trans disease fungi detected in both asymptomatic and symptomatic nursery materials, so that gives us an idea of the latent stage of these pathogens. Uh, and it's important to determine which abiotic and biotic stress conditions will may favor disease. So again, you know, as David has mentioned, it's critical to develop and implement this control of trans disease fungi at a nursery level. So with that, I will thank, of course, our funding, CGCN, uh, British Columbia One Great Council, with matching funds from the government of Canada, and none of this work who have been possible, of course, without my lab or any, uh, all the collaborators that are working on these projects. So with that, thank you very much, and I will stop here. Thank you very much, Jose. I know a lot of uh, the pan or the attendees here are from Canada and within Ontario, so it's important that they see the Canadian perspective and updates on your research. Um, so we're at about 2.20 now. We're supposed to end at 2.30, but we are able to go a little bit over time, so please stay logged in if you're able to, and we will get to our questions now. So the first one we have is, I think this is more directed at uh, Jonathan's we are looking to see what is meant by vine surgery. Sure, in, in our example, we're referring to um, removing the vine just above the grafting wound. When we, when we refer to vine surgery, that's what we're referring to. Not okay. just cutting out a wound, but taking the whole vine down to the, the grafting wound. So Darian, I can, I can provide it a bit, uh, you know, um, so, so bind surgery is referred as, as Jonathan has mentioned, you know, the, the pathogens infect aerial parts of the plant probably start in the cordons, they will go into the, into the trunk. So the bind surgery basically means to start removing these infected parts of the, of the plant. You can either do bind surgery, either removing a cordon, if you have detected the disease, you know, in some of the spur positions, you know, uh, but studies in Australia actually have uh, shown that the best way to do vine surgery is to go all the way down, you know, to basically uh, the trunk, because it's very costly, you know, to do just a few parts of the plants and just inspect which ones are infected or not. So they came that, you know, a certain age, actually, I believe, Jonathan, you know, in Australia, they have in some of their management practices, because this is pressure is so high, they include in their in their vineyard production that maybe a year 15 or 20 they need to do this vine surgery and remove all the all the vines down to as, as uh, jonathan has mentioned to to start production again okay thank you uh our next question is a uh, multi-pronged question so i'll take this one a little bit slower uh the first part is what are some pruning wound protectants that were effective and do we know of any that are available here in Canada, more specifically Ontario? Um, well, I can I can start with that. David can can talk about the European perspective, maybe. So there are there are there are many different products that they are you know, uh, and Jonathan has mentioned some of them. You know, Topsinem, you know, Tiofanatimethyl. Topsinem is the brand name in in um, uh, California. Theophanatometer is probably one of we show has the, the best control because it has a broad spectrum with many different fungi. So it's, it's against, you know, it can, instead of targeting one particular trans disease, actually works with some of the most important one. So actually that work, uh, we, we conducted that work in California back in the days for registration of theophanatometer. Uh, we, uh, there are other products, you know, for example, on the... Uh, Carbendazines or uh, Tebuconazol has been shown as a very, very successful uh, product in Australia and New Zealand um, a use in, in terms of chemical products. Unfortunately, we have none in Canada. We, there is no currently any chemical or biological product 
to the best of my knowledge as of today uh, register. So we have been we have been working a lot on that, uh, and I finally have some good news that um, some of the trials we have done and work we have few products on the pipeline to be registered. Actually, there's going to be a, a project right now uh, with uh, Tiofanatemethyl, as well as there are other companies with biological controls that are interested in, in registering products. So hopefully in Canada, we are going to see our first product register within the next two, three years. Hopefully, hopefully that's our, our hope. But as of now, we have nothing specifically for trans diseases in, in Canada. I don't know if David wants to comment a bit in the um, European situation, which is quite different. <laughs> well, I agree with you that the benzimidazole group is the most effective, carbendazine, benomil, uh, tiofanate methyl, but we don't have these products in Europe. Um, the, in Europe, we have the Tessior is from the BASF company. I don't know the name in, in US, it's another name, but the active ingredients are uh, boscalid and pilaclostrobin. Um, this is a physical barrier plus the fungicides and can be applied by, by spraying. So, and it is quite effective. I don't know the name, I'm checking the name in, in US. It's not Tessior, it's another name, but uh, uh, some we researchers. A, uh, Wendy has said that it's called Pristine here. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So that was one of the products that uh, also was tested in California against trans disease uh -huh. and it's effective. So, I mean, again, you know, I mean, we, we have some of these active ingredients approved for other diseases in Canada, like powdery milieu, for example, uh, which, you know, it's, it's, it's good in the sense that we have half the way done, the, the products are already registered, but now we have to show also efficacy here in Canada. And so, so I mean, there, there are options out there. It's just, you know, the slow process of getting registered or even label extension in this case that would work, you know, in, in, in that sense. Another thing we had to comment, uh, I think it's important when we talk about products, the best products against grapevine trans diseases are all group three products. And we know what that means in terms of resistance. You know, I mean, when we already have several group three products in our powdery mildew or botrytis spray, you know, a calendar or uh, schedule, if we are adding one more spray for trans diseases, you know, uh, we, we have to evaluate also all these risks, you know, uh, for, for these fungicides. Um, so again, it's, it's not a perfect solution out there, but uh, things are coming out. But I mean, growers have to take into account that as well. Okay, the next question. Um, are there any recommended labs to send samples to for testing? Again, this is, this is a question from Ontario, but we can generally ask this for Canada? And then also, are there any labs that test this within the European perspective? Um, to the best of my knowledge here in Canada, I'm not aware of any lab that tests per se for trans diseases. Uh, um, here in BC, for example, we have the provincial lab uh, uh, in Abbasford for the, the BC province, uh, Minister of Agriculture, that they receive samples and they 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 are able, you know, to 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 diagnose some of these um, pathogens. But overall, I would say that, to the best of my knowledge, there is there is something that it hasn't been really implemented in in many of the diagnostic labs I know in Canada. Like the they test for viruses, maybe or other things. I don't know in California or or, or Europe how there are there are specific labs for that. I know there are some in the States, but. Doesn't seem to be very good news for us then. <laughs> um, well, it's, uh, they, they, they are they are diagnostic labs there, you know, that they can, they do plant uh, diagnostic. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, the people need to be trained, you know, uh, how to do the, and so it's, it's, it's feasible. It's just, you know, a, a, a tech trend. Uh, take transfer, you know, to, to how to look for these pathogens. And I've done that here in BC with the provincial lab. Um, and, you know, it can be done in other, in other labs as, as well. Okay, so the next question is, what is the rationale for later pruning in California? Is there not a potential for higher pathogen spore load in the environment shortly before bud break? Um, so, Maybe I'll answer the first part first. <laughs> um, so in, in California, the pruning happens during the dormant season. 
and um, during December and January, it's colder and wetter. And so it takes a very long time, two to three weeks for pruning wounds to heal. And the rain will splash and spread the um, spores. Um, and so during December and January, which is the early part of the pruning wound, the pruning season, um, the vines are highly susceptible in February and March here in California, the, the rains have slowed and, and we have a much drier climate and it takes the pruning wounds maybe three or four days to heal. And so they're much less susceptible um, during those periods. And then if a pruning wound protectant is applied immediately, um, it also is likely to last longer <laughs> uh, in the late season because the rain will could have an adverse effect on those pruning wound protectants. Um, so maybe that answers both parts. Yeah, I would like to include to, to add here that um, late pruning is something that it works under California weather conditions, and that's very important. You know, they are very different than our conditions in Canada or other parts of the world. Uh, so it's a it's a technique that for California weather is is useful. But for example, here in BC, we have the opposite. Uh, the, our studies have shown that the, the, most of the inoculum is present after we leave you know, the cold and winter months. So by the end of March, early April, when you know, our temperatures start raising and we get our wet months, usually here in BC is May, June, this is the highest load of uh, inoculum. So for example, for us here in BC, do a late pruning wouldn't be recommended, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend do late pruning because the wounds would be susceptible, you know, uh, to, to when the inoculum. And our work has shown that early pruning in our case, you know, uh, significantly reduced disease. And I believe there are studies also conducted in Spain where early pruning in Spain were also, mm -hmm. it's just a, uh, yeah. We recommend early pruning. But the problem we have here in Spain is the spring frost. If we make early pruning, we have uh, frost in the spring, every spring. So we have some problems. But for the pathological point of view, we recommend early pruning. So every, every region is different. And that's why you know, the point, you know, that is very important is that what is done in, you know, Spain may not work in California. What is done in California may not work in, in, in BC or in Ontario or other parts of Canada. So that's why it's, it's significantly important to have a regional, you know, uh, idea of how the disease is, is working in, in the area. Because even within Canada, I mean, Ontario, Nova Scotia, Quebec conditions are totally different from, from BC. Knowing when they're most susceptible and when yeah. the inoculum is highest. The next question is directed at Jonathan. Is the frequency of vines with trunk diseases in California similar to BC? So I guess this would be more of a discussion based on the presentation from BC and then California here today. I, 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 here in California, it's, I think, widely, I don't know how, uh, I believe that grapevine trunk diseases are ubiquitous throughout the state. Vines anywhere in the state are likely to have trunk diseases um, at some point. Um, I don't know what the numbers are um, in terms of in, infected vineyards, similar to what Jose presented earlier. Um, but we're fair, well, at least I'm fairly convinced um, that nearly all the vineyards um, at some point will be susceptible to trunk diseases. Um, just because of, of their, their, their being found everywhere um, in, in young and old lines. Jose, do you have any insights? Yeah, on that? I mean, we, we conducted, when I was a PhD with Doug Gubler in California, we conducted large field survey throughout the province, uh, in, in throughout the state, sorry, we are in the states now throughout the state in, uh, in California. And we found basically, as Jonathan mentioned, all the counties where you know, grapes are grown, you will find trans diseases. They were, we, the only difference we found were the, the incidence of the pathogens. We found areas in California where we will find more maybe Botryosphaeria species, other areas where we will find probably more Utaipa uh, uh, infection. Uh, in the Central Valley, for example, ESCA was a problem mostly on the 
on the table grapes. That was a high incidence of S count table grapes. So, and, and the numbers are um, probably higher in California in the sense it's a much older viticulture with, you know, more mature vineyards, you know, maybe in the 30, 40, 50 years old also that we don't have here as many. <laughs> I would say right now, probably in BC, the average, you know, probably 20, 25 years old. We have some vineyards, you know, much older, but um, so that may be why our infection rates are maybe a bit, a bit lower, but still I saw 95% of our survey vineyards were showing whether it was a 2% incidence or an 80% incidence. So uh, yeah, it's, it's there. Okay. Uh... It was mentioned that different varieties had different infection rates and inoculum loads in different parts were infected. Have you ever thought about doing phase contrast X-ray imaging with Fourier transform mid infrared spectroscopy to, to determine if there is a physiological reason for why this is? Um, let's see if I understand correct. The so so why do so try to understand the physiological part behind why different plants have different. Uh, uh, I, think, I think more than the physiology or the, the, the type of imaging you can use for detection or the type of detection, I think it's a fact that different parts of the plant uh, come from the nursery where we make most of, you know, graft union and the, 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 the rootstock is where we make all the cuts. And that's where the point of entrance. That's why I believe we find more infection in those areas than probably in, in other parts. However, when you bring plants from the field, the roots are sometimes, you know, heavily infected with syndrocarpon, you know. There are different parts, and I, I don't know if I understand really the, the question. There are different methods, you know, to probably detect. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't used, I don't have experience using directly, you know, the, the infrared or some other imaging devices for detection. I know it has been done. We are doing some work uh, here to try to start looking into drone uh, fly and imaging for, for detection, uh, hopefully an early detection, but not with the, too much success. For example, in the sense that some of these diseases don't even cause any foliar symptoms, you know, are internal in the, in the, in the canker. So it's very hard from uh, in imaging in the, in the foliage to, to observe that. It has been worked done with X-ray and other, you know, but the problem is, it's really tedious and it's very time consuming and expensive. So when you look into a diagnostic tool that can be standardized in commercial use, that's, that's the difficulties we enter. And maybe David has more experience with that, uh, David. I didn't work on that, but I think the French people are working on this type of techniques, but um, I think they didn't get any good result yet. So just waiting for that but I don't have any experience. But yeah, it would be nice to establish a collaboration with Dustin uh, yeah. these kind of, <laughs> of techniques. Exactly. <laughs> um, so our next question, David mentioned that they use white mustard as a cover crop for controlling uh, trunk diseases in Europe. Do you know if any research has been done looking at more cold hardy mustard such as Camelina sativa as cover crop in Canada to control trunk diseases? I think, Jose, you did something with uh, white mustard in Canada? And no, it's not our group. Reasons? No, it was not our okay, group. No, no. no uh, I know it has been published, you know, white mustard uh, overall, uh, but it was not our group. So uh, I think that there, is, there are reports in the bibliography that mustards overall have been reducing cylindrocarpon inoculum. Also, they are nematicides, so that's why also mm -hmm. they are probably used more for the nematode side than for the uh, cylindrocarpon on the soil. So probably they have seen a secondary effect on the syndocarpon, but the mustards overall uh, is my understanding a part of the incorporation and these things are, are sometimes used as, as nematicides. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we'll do maybe two or three more questions and have a hard stop at 2.45 uh, Eastern time. So next question being, can pathogens be spread with pruners or pre-pruners -pr -pre or hedgers? I will leave that to the bit. <laughs> well, uh, some researchers demonstrated under control conditions that pruning, pr pruning scissors can spread fungal trunk pathogens. But in my opinion, I think it's not the main way to spread fungal trunk pathogens. So in fact, when we analyze the, 
the seasonal cane, so the cane of the season. So we didn't get any fungal trunk pathogens or the abundance is so low compared to the trunk or the, or the other parts of the plant. So I don't think pruning scissors are the main way to spread these pathogens. This is my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Sorry. No, I, I would agree with that. No. I've heard similarly too. And also, you know, the cost that many times is advised that you have to disinfect your pruners, you know, between plants and every cut, the cost and time for that, uh, uh, for what we know it can actually, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not viable, you know, to do that, that uh, uh, technique, because we know that it's, it's not the main, main uh, source of infection. Well, if you see a vine really affected during the season, try to keep it. Uh, for the end of the of the pruning time, so just to 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 prune it, the last one. If you see some uh, symptom, clear symptom of trunk diseases, but you know in general, I think it's not viable. The thing Maybe also, many times what we see uh, symptoms on the upper part on the foliage as a, are a result of a constriction in the vascular system, either in the cordon or in the trunk. So sometimes um, the, the, the pathogen, as David mentioned, yeah. is not present in yeah, that, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. dormant wood that you're going to prune after the, the pruning season. It's probably you see the symptoms because the cordon of the trunk have the pathogen, there is vascular constriction or some of the toxins or secondary metabolites fungi produced, they can be translocated to cause those symptoms. But usually it's um, the, the, the pathogen is not really there for the one-year-old uh, canes. All right, moving on to our next question. Is there a way to determine which grapevine trunk diseases soil-borne pathogens are present or is it just assumed that they are present? Um, well, I mean, the, the, the main soil-borne is uh, the Cinidocarpon Ironectria group for Blackfoot. Those are the ones we know they are soil-borne. Uh, they are ubiquitous, you know, Cinidocarpon you can find probably in, in, in most different type of soils. Even in non-cultivated soil, you can find Cinidocarpon. Uh, there are ways to test soil, you know, you can test soil by different methods to, to, to know the, the infection. And now with the, the new quantification tools we have, you can even assess, you know, the amount of pathogen you may have in, in, in that soil. So this is totally uh, viable. Uh, but my experience with syndrocarpon is, is, is something that you will find at either a low or very high in many different type of soils, even non-cultivated soils is there. David, I don't know your experience yeah, in Spain, I, I but I think you. it's a... I agree with you. So they are, these fungi are everywhere. And it depends on the inoculum level and the aggressiveness of each strain. But you can find blackfoot in all the soils all around the world. So I think there are many methods, molecular methods, but you know, you will, you will find them in every single soil. So the, the, the thing is also, for example, another group of fungi that it, 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 it came to our attention is the Fusarium group. I mean, we have been found in Fusarium a lot in, in, in planting material, mostly on the, on, the, on the roots part. We know Fusarium usually is, is uh, in, in terms of grapes, they are, they are not even really diseases caused by Fusarium. It's a very weak pathogen for, for grapes. I mean, it's mostly a problem on, on annual crops or other type of crops. However, we found that even a weak pathogen in a very high concentration under optimum conditions of grow, you know, it could actually cause cause problems. So this is another thing that we are we are trying to look at because we have found also high amount of fusarium in, in planting material as well. Okay, I think I'll make this our last question of the day and then I'll close out our session. Which is more susceptible to infection, cordon or cane pruned vines? And that's a very interesting uh, question that we, we continuously get asked. Um, so if you think that the, the, the two different systems, uh, cane prune versus cordon prune, uh, the, the, the pruning system doesn't determine whether the plant is more or less acceptable. I mean, the, 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 the cultivar is what we know is more or less acceptable. So we know, for example, Chardonnay is one of the most acceptable with Sauvignon Blanc and Merlot or Cabernet Sauvignon are probably some of the, the least acceptable. What we see whether a vine is cordon prune versus cane prune is the way the prune is done. In a cordon prune, you have many 
cuts done on every spur position with the their points of entrance. So you are able to identify the disease earlier before you know the pathogen gets into the trunk, into the main uh, part of the plant. Because if it's, uh, all these spores are gonna start dying back as the picture I saw, you may be able to start you know, eliminating this cordon and replace. What happened with cane prune is the majority of the cuts are done at the crown, at the top of the trunk. So the, the pathogen gets you know, the infection, basically the area where we want the least, you know, at the trunk and start going down in the trunk. We are gonna see, you know, um, I, 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 I got that from parts where they do heavily cane pruning, where well, we don't see trunk diseases, we don't have problems with trunk diseases, we don't see the plants or the symptoms so severe as in cordon uh, prune. And it's because, you know, the pathogen is working his way in the trunk, the trunk is expanding, you know, it has way more boot to colonize and to eliminate versus juicy symptoms. What happened in cane pruning? We get calls from growers where they have, you know, not trans disease for 20 years and they call us in the year 21 and they say, my vines are collapsing. Every single vine I have is dying and we don't know why. We cut those crowns, you know, and it's completely infected. It takes much longer just by the nature of the infection and where the infection is located, but the susceptibility is, uh, so you may be able, you know, we don't have those studies done, maybe a cane prune vine so symptoms later and it can be longer productive, I don't know, versus esper prune. I don't know if Jonathan has those observations, but what we see is the infection happens and when it happens, you have basically nothing to do because it's basically the whole trunk is already gone. Versus the cordon, you can still probably work and follow the disease progression. That's, this is my experience and what we have been seeing. I don't know, David, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think the host's explanation was mm, perfect. And also it depends how the grower makes the pruning practice and also the inoculum level in the environment. So it depends on the region. But I think the, the explanation of Jose was excellent. Also, also we compare the number of boons done in cane pruning versus cordon. Um, probably this uh, David can talk about Spain still has a lot of bush vines, you know, head train uh, vines, mm -hmm. not cordon where we see that the vineyards long, you know, they last longer. Uh, mm -hmm. But basically it's because the number of pruning wounds made in those vines are much lower than in a cordon pruning. You see a cordon where you have maybe a meter and you have maybe 10 spare positions per cordon. That spare position is two pruning wounds, you know, per spare position. So you, you have 20 avenues for the pathogen to enter in a cordon. Why, for example, in a cane pruner in a bush vine, as in Spain, they have a lot. They are way, way less um, uh, uh, pruning, pruning cats or pruning guns in that. So that makes also another, another big difference. Mm -hmm. You're right. Sorry, I know we have one more question in the chat, but I'm unfortunately going to have to end the session today. And I will. Can I add one more question to to David? Or yeah, just one more thing quickly, Go because ahead. I'm also. I mean, we are we are. <laughs> We are talking here with the, you know, uh, Canadian Grey Certification Network, and I, I want to, to know from Jonathan and David, um, in terms of trans diseases, uh, how, how, how clean plant programs in Europe or in California, I mean, we have one of the best clean plant programs in California, Foundation Plant Service, how are addressing the issue of, of trans diseases? Are they even considering implementing or are there, I mean, we know the difficulties with trans disease. I just wanted to, to, to hear their opinion on, on that in the clean plan programs they have. Well, we don't have any clean plan program. So we have like a document. I, they recommend uh, planting material with no um, pathogens included in a list, but you know, no one is checking this planting material. And uh, in general, we recommend some practices like hot water treatment and some chemicals, but you know, is, we don't have any, any program, a specific program. For is most of the material pathogen. planted in Spain, David, is, is produced in Spain or are, are, is there also a lot of imported material from other countries? Uh, it's produced in Spain, mainly in Spain. Okay. Uh -huh. But we have something for viruses, for uh, uh, bacteria, but not for trunk disease pathogens, so. Yeah, I, similarly, I'm not, a I don't, we don't have something like that here. Lots grown. I know we did go visit with nurseries to, to share with them what we found and encourage, you know, clean product. Um, but clearly there's, there's 
lots of opportunity to and a lot of reason to provide clean rootstock. Um, Okay, well, that was a great discussion to end our session. And before, I know we went 20, about 20 minutes over time, so I'm sorry about that. Maybe we got to make these sessions two hours in length instead. That's um, always happened when you put scientists, you know, to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just close out our session here. Um, I want to thank our three guests here today, uh, Jose, David, and uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for presenting, for offering your different perspectives from around the world. In order to make thank sure you we're very able much. Thank to you. post this session, uh, we have to present this license here uh, for our AFC present presentations. Join us again next year, so in early 2022, when CGCM will be hosting a one year later update on grapevine trunk diseases. In this future webinar, we will be welcoming back uh, Jose, along with some other international guests. We will discuss the current situation regarding grapevine trunk disease in Canada and internationally, pruning and disease management in mature vineyards. And lastly, we are having the fourth installation in this four-part webinar, webinar series on Thursday, July 22nd. We will welcome guests back to speak about rootstocks. This webinar in July will be a little bit different than what you're used to seeing from CGCN. As usual, we'll be welcoming Canadian and international speakers but this webinar will include a panel discussion. Time is set at 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The link to register for the next webinar will be open in, in early July. So make sure you are subscribed to our e-newsletter via email um, to be informed of this date and the registration link. And you can subscribe to our newsletter by visiting our contact page on CGCN's website. And with that, we conclude our presentation. And thank you so much for everyone uh, attending today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Have a great day.